Hello, everyone. My name is Marta Wojcik. I'm executive director and curator of the Westcott House, and I want to welcome you. I have such pleasure to welcome people from all around the world again for the sixth edition of Right Sites and Pachakucha. Uh, how wonderful it is to be here together. Uh, this collaboration started in 2020. Uh, I would say in the depth of, uh, of despair uh, when we were all uh, wondering what's going to happen next. And this event brought us together uh, to, uh, to really, um, you know, bring togetherness as much as possible via Zoom. <laughs> and it actually worked pretty well. And we since continued because that's the only way we just simply have no way to fly you over to Springfield or Chicago or Japan all at the same time. So this is our the, the second best thing we can do. And we are so thrilled that many of you continue uh, to, uh, to join in and listen to some really amazing presenta presentations. Uh, this uh, one, this particular uh, uh, event has a, a special theme uh, right in the path. And it was actually coined by Ryan from Greycliff, and we are very grateful for, for this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful theme. Um, and um, our speakers um, uh, will focus on frankly tried sites uh, that are in the path of totality. And so we thought it was pretty interesting to, to kind of make it a theme. And as we looked closer, there are actually quite a few of right sites in the path. Uh, so uh, just shortly, you know, on April 8th, um, uh, we so just uh, about a week ago, a, a week from now, uh, tens of millions of Americans will uh, will share one of the universe uh, universe's most spectacular events, a total eclipse of the sun by the moon. Uh, so while all the 50 uh, states will experience a partial eclipse, only about 115 mile wide path of totality will see the moon completely blocked by the sun, uh, completely block the sun. Uh, so we have about uh, 17 frankly tried designs in that path. Um, and thank you for Mari, my colleague that, that researched that. Uh, we have about 17 and then almost in the path of totality, we have about uh, five more sites. So it's very exciting. And we think it's, uh, you know, it's just something we can um, uh, have as a, as a great excuse to feature some of the most amazing, frankly, tried designs. Um, so a couple of things, uh, just logistics. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for putting in a chat um, uh, some information where, where everyone is coming from. Uh, I see Thailand, I see Buffalo, I see Texas, I see Florida, um, there is Columbus, there is Oregon, there is Montreal. Uh, There's so many, and we're gonna we're gonna keep looking and and um, uh, from time to time we we call someone out because it's really fabulous. Um, this attendance is wonderful, and um, we we ask you that you put in a chat any comments that you want to share with speakers, any reactions you have to their talks. However, if you have specific question uh, for any of them, it's uh, it would be ideal if you put it in Q&A. Uh, that would make our life much easier because then we can keep track of your questions and we can make sure that by the end of the presentations, we when we go into Q&A session, we can actually try to answer those. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Um, and I think, um, I believe we are ready to start. I would like to make sure that we first start with uh, introducing uh, host uh, uh, organizations. So um, Westcott is one of the organizers, uh, but we, from the beginning, uh, we forged this partnership with the Frankly Tried Building Conservancy uh, based in Chicago, but really an organization that is uh, has an impact um, uh, on all the right sites all across the United States and also has a relation with, job, uh, with, with sites in Japan. Uh, and we have also Pechakucha headquarters. Uh, so uh, Brian is here from Tokyo and um, he's drinking his morning coffee. We all are in all different uh, time zones. So it's, it's again, uh, uh, very fun to, to get together like that. So I want to uh, uh, ask, uh, yeah, here, here is Eric, here is Brian. Hello, everyone. Hey, Thank gang. Good Great to see, see you guys it. again. It's another year of Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm so excited. 
That's right. I'm excited too. Hi, Eric. Hello. Hi from our office in Chicago. How are y'all? Very good. good. I Very saw, good. I see there's so many corners of the globe tuning in. It's really exciting. Hometown Tulsa represent. I saw Tulsa in the chat. That's pretty cool. <laughs> hey, hey, there's a, if you if you want to move back to Tulsa, Brian, there is a Frank Lloyd Wright house for sale right now. Okay, let's get the conservancy on board with that. I'm definitely uh, I'm definitely keen. Okay, well that's really cool. Well, uh, I'm really excited about a great event. Should, Marta, you want to go ahead and keep the introductions going? Uh, absolutely. So we have just a couple slides uh, from uh, Westcott. You know, just I think many of people already know we are based in Springfield, Ohio, and um, we are a prairie style house by Frank Lloyd Wright. And we have this wonderful relation with Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, uh, the organization that was instrumental in saving the Westcott house. Uh, and as a result, we opened to the public in 2005. So next year, we'll celebrate 20 years of public engagement, which is very, very very exciting and I can't believe how fast time flies. So, um, Eric, uh, I think the next one is, is frankly tried building conservancy. Yeah, so we're really honored to be a part of this partnership and uh, it's, it's really exciting to see how interest in Frank Lloyd Wright and his buildings brings people together all across the globe. Um, so we are a nonprofit based in Chicago, as Marta mentioned. Our mission is to facilitate the stewardship and preservation of the remaining built works of Frank Lloyd Wright. And we do that through advocacy, education, and technical services. So obviously education includes all kinds of events like partnering with the Westcott House and Pachaka Cha to make events like this happen. Um, we also, if you really want to dive into the deep end, we hold an annual conference, which will be in Detroit this year, September 25th through 29th. Um, if you'd like to see the house that's up on your screen right now, that's the Turkel House built in 1955 in Detroit. We will be touring that among many others. So uh, encourage you to get involved and learn more about our organization as well. We're at uh, saveright.org. Thank you so much. And yes, we have the links. Uh, Regan from our team is putting those links in the chat. So um, everyone make sure that you you follow that link and learn about conference. Uh, the owners of Turkel House uh, did presentation for Pachakucha. So it's also available on pachakucha.org. Um, uh, uh, and uh, of course, the best thing is to attend the conference and see this house in person. <laughs> I think they throw some good parties there as well, as if I recall. So I've heard. Well, speaking of parties, um, Pachakcha is the uh, show and tell fun uh, community event that started in Tokyo some 20 years ago and has spread around the world. And you have all the presenters tonight have us to blame for presenting in this unique 20 by 20 presentation format where people present 20 slides at advance every 20 seconds creating concise presentations that really um, have impact. And the reason that we're working with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and that we're so honored to be working, uh, you know, connected to the Frank Lloyd Wright community is because architecture is in our DNA. This is our founders, uh, Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham, who, who run Klein Dytham Architecture here in uh, Tokyo. They've got a 20 summer practice and their uh, side project, their job by night is the Pachakcha organization. And so uh, many of the Pachakucha night series around the world uh, have architects who are running it. And that's why uh, we're part, that's why we've uh, so connected to architecture. This character in the center is Hisayama-san. He's the guy who actually made the name Pachakcha, which is the sound of chit-chat, blah, 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 chit-chat, chit-chat, blah, 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 Pachakucha, Pachakucha, Pachakucha. And so, yes, Pachakucha uh, started, as I mentioned, in 2000. And I just wanted to highlight that this is our, last year was our 20th anniversary. It's from a one-off event in Tokyo, it's spread to an amazing 1,300 cities around the world. If you've, uh, if you ch check the PK calendar, there might be a PK night in your city. Uh, maybe you've been a presenter on the stage. Uh, be encouraged to check the website to uh, get engaged in your local Pachak tonight. Now, this is the sixth session that we've had with the Right Site organization. It's really exciting. All the presentations that were made for tonight's event and that were made for the past events are on the PK website. Uh, the link is right there. We'll drop it in the chat. And uh, it's a really amazing collaboration where we've collected 
an amazing archive of Frank Lloyd Wright legacy. And we're very, very proud of that. And, and we're really grateful that we continue this collaboration. Six events, 40, 49 presentations are, and um, it's been viewed 145,000 times. So there's a lot of interest in this event. And um, we really hope that we can continue the success of this event. Um, it's again, it's just such a great collaboration. And um, we're so proud and happy to be part of it. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, Eric, and the whole Frank Lloyd Wright community. Oh, thank you so much. So I, back to you, Marta. Yeah. Yes, that's our prompt. The next slide will uh, will uh, uh, will that we will share will uh, give you some insight into speakers who we have tonight. We are just um, really lucky to have uh, such uh, amazing individuals contribute their time and their talents and many many years of. Uh, studies of this subject. So um, if I could ask just for a second for all the speakers to turn on their uh, video, their camera, and uh, we just gonna see you all and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So as, as we mentioned, we have uh, we have uh, 17 frankly tried designs within a path of totality, but of course we can't cover all of it. So we're gonna highlight a number of them that are kind of across the path, which is really exciting. So uh, how is everyone? Good, right. good. <laughs> Doing well, thank you. Drinking coffee, tea, yeah. whatever else you have in your mug. We won't judge. <laughs> Um, Maybe Brian, because it's what time is it, Brian? <laughs> yeah, he's it's beer thirty somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it's uh, it's pretty amazing, and uh, thank you to to everyone uh, who is joining us from Japan and from uh, from countries that are. Uh, it's early morning, and mm -hmm. there is true commitment to frankly dry community, so we appreciate it, and we're gonna try to make it worthwhile. So. Um, well, um, I think what we're going to do now is I think it's time to start the presentation. And uh, so I'm going to, it is uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce our speakers. And our first speaker is uh, Jack Quinnen. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to share a little bit about Jack, but we're also going to share links of, uh, to 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 sp speakers bio. So please explore that and any links that we provide. Uh, so, Jack is a distinguished service professor emeritus at State uh, at State University of New York um, at, at Buffalo. He has his bachelor's from Dartmouth College and AM and PhD Brown from Brown University. He's a historian of architecture, specializing in the architecture of Frankly Trite, the arts and crafts movement, American architecture of the 19th century. Utopian Communities and the Relation of Architecture and Phenomenology. Oh my goodness, that phenom... <laughs> you see, I always mess up that word. I'm going to practice and I'm going to prove that I can say it after Jack's uh, talk. He is a founder of Frankly Tried Building Conservancy. Here is the link. Um, in 1982, he led a campaign to purchase the Frankly Tried Darwin Martin Papers, arguably the most complete body of archival materials on a major work of architecture in history. Uh, Quinnen, a fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians, has published extensively on Wright, H.H. H. Richardson, and the Arts and Crafts Movement. And uh, my, my claim to fame is that uh, uh, me and Kevin once crashed at Jack's uh, house uh, for the conference and we had the best time and he was the most uh, gracious host, he and his wife. And uh, we that was our amazing introduction to uh, Buffalo community, uh, which is uh, just as you will learn tonight, uh, quite an impressive community when it comes to Frankly Tried. So welcome Jack, how are you? Nice to see you and hear you. <laughs> oh, great to hear you. Thank you for doing this. And whenever you're ready, we're going to start your slide. So you tell us, are you ready? I'm ready. Wonderful. <clears throat> the story of Frank Lloyd Wright's Larkin administration building began in 1875 with the formation of the Larkin Soap Company in Buffalo, New York. Under the direction of John Larkin, 
Initially, the company manufactured soap to be sold by salesmen or soap slingers who worked door to door through designated neighborhoods. However, Larkin soon realized that he could expand the business by transitioning from door to door sales to mail or a mail order operation that utilized sales catalogs featuring redeemable pa paper certificates. Larkin's inspiration called for an increasingly sophisticated business model, and the company expanded accordingly. From 1877 on, New Larkin Company buildings were constructed with such frequency that John Larkin re recognized the need for a new administration building in which the complexities of running the business locally for soap production and nationally for sales could be realized. Now, how Frank Lloyd Wright was awarded the commission is another story. Business people in Buffalo held Chicago in high regard and the 37-year-old Wright was beginning to draw attention far beyond Chicago and the upper Midwest. His charge from the Larkin Company was to design a building that would efficiently accommodate its 1,800 employees. Although administration buildings were typically situated in downtowns, this building, well, east of downtown Buffalo was and bracketed by multiple tracks of the New York Central Railroad would eventually grow into a totally functioning city-like entity. Due to its industrial surroundings, Wright's building had to be sealed, air conditioned, sound resistant, and well il illuminated in order to maximize the office employees activities. The Larkin building was rectangularly planned and five and a half stories tall with a slender four-story annex along the building's east side that included the main entrance and a, lo a lobby, two floors of lockers, a lounge and a classroom. The entire building was steel framed and brick clad within which its central light court was surrounded by five levels of balconies. The quality of light within the building was particularly important to a daily work routine involving the handling of mail to and from thousands of Larkin customers. Each floor level was illuminated from three sources. A skylight covered the central light court. Four by five foot plate glass windows lined the building's exterior walls and electrical Nernst blowers were placed above most of the typist's desks and in clusters atop the piers framing the light court. The glazed white brick surfaces of the interior columns and spandrels further enhanced the quality of light in the building's interior. Mail trucks entered the basement of the building daily through an arched opening on Seneca Street that led to where the mail was sorted and distributed. Let's take a tour of the building with one of the specialized employees whom we will call Becky. Here we see her poised on roller skates to distribute mail throughout the building. We might imagine how at the outset of her journey into Buffalo's industrial area, but Becky might have reacted to the daunting masses of the Larkin building's exterior. Yet she quickly adapted to the building's interior. She would enter at sunrise through the annex on the eastern side of the main building and report to the basement to receive her allotment of mail. Becky would then ride the elevator to the fifth floor where she would begin the delivery of mail downward floor by floor to desks throughout the building's five, five floors. There was much for her to do adjust to. Initially, there was the clatter of hundreds of typewriters reverberating within the five-story spaces. And Becky worked in view of an untold number of eyes from the surrounding balconies. Considering the cement 
hard magnesite floors and the cast iron furniture, falling was not an option. Be Becky's knowledge of the Larkin building became proficient as she experienced it over time in an assortment of light and sound conditions. And there was always something for her to discover as she made her rounds. Enjoyment was available to her in the form of music from the Mueller organ, guest speakers in the light court, luncheon on the fifth floor dining room, and occasional opportunities to re retreat to the fern garden on the top floor. In fact, the building's monumentality was extensively humanized through three-dimensional sculptures, as well as wall reliefs, many of which fe featured winged goddesses, inspirational quotations, and biblical passages that were inscribed in the in entrance lobby and on other prominent wall surfaces. Becky was particularly sensitive to the radiance of the interior and the way the sun over the course of the day illuminated the workspaces as it passed through the skylight and the many windows and ricocheted off the glazed walls. As the afternoon wore on, Becky looked forward to resting her feet, but she went home with a certain reluctance as the administration building fostered a strong Larkin familial identity to which she had come to belong. Thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. This is a, this is kind of symbolic to, to open our evening with this talk. Um, can you tell us, um, of course, you know, we, we count Larkin building, which is kind of um, in terms of like existing uh, designs, it's only a wall, right, that remains uh, that yeah. is still in Buffalo. Uh, but and, a, and a basement. Well, <laughs> and the basement. Yeah. And uh, this building really uh, generated, I mean, there, there's a logo of uh, frankly, tried building conservancy, right? That is inspired by that building. So it's very important for the mm -hmm. preservation movement. Yeah. Yes. What year did we lose this building? Yeah, probably knows. <laughs> uh, 1950. 1950, yes. That's, that's just uh, uh, incredible to walk through that space. Thank you so much for, for this wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank and, you. So uh, we're gonna go to the next presenter. And again, if you uh, if you uh, have any questions for Jack or any speaker that is upcoming, just uh, just leave us a question in Q and A. Martin, and, you you promised to try to pronounce phenomenology, oh and I don't want goodness. to hold our audience from that opportunity of hearing that. Phenomenology. Not uh, perfect. Okay, good, good. When I get stressed out, I cannot say this word for some reason. English uh, really um, disappoints me sometimes, uh, or I disappoint English, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> okay, let's go to Anna. Uh, so um, uh, Anna Kaplan, from, uh, she's an executive director from Greycliff. Um, uh, she, uh, I believe, started in 2019, right before pandemic. And it's pretty incredible what she, uh, she has accomplished since then. Um, she, uh, the, if you don't know, Greycliff is fr the Frankly Tried Design Summer Home uh, for Isabel and Darwin D. Martin, just south of Buffalo, New York. Uh, Anna holds a, a master's in the history of decorative arts, design history, and material culture from the Bard Graduate Center, and uh, a BA in art history and Italian studies from Brown University. Uh, prior to Greycliff, she owned and managed the Anna Kaplan Contemporary and also uh, managed Resource Art, a collaborative art consultancy. Uh, and of course, we must direct you to experiencegreycliff.org, where you can find all about Greycliff and hopefully plan your next visit. Hello, Anna. How are you? Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. Happy oh, to thank be here. You. I believe it's your spring break, right? So it this is, is extra yeah. special to get your attention and your participation. So thank you. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> My pleasure. Yes, I'm ready. Wonderful. 
Okay, to orient us to the setting, let's take a look at this historic image to start. Greycliff was always about summer, and here you can see a few of the beachgoers that would spend warmer months on the shore of Lake Erie. Look beyond these stylish bathers to that impressive cliff, and on the far left, you can spy the main house at Greycliff. My presentation is, of course, about Greycliff, and because of our theme, I also must take the opportunity to include the sun. When we think about summer, water and sun are central. I'm hoping that my presentation will channel all those summery vibes and vitamin D and pass them through the screen to you. But let's get back to the architecture. This is the main house at Greycliff being constructed in 1926-27. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright for Isabel and Darwin Martin. And it's important to note how Wright integrated the landscape, most notably the lake and the location atop a cliff into his design. The property pictured here was designed by Wright to be a wonderful summer retreat for the Martins and was in contrast to the family's urban residence about 20 miles away in Buffalo's Parkside neighborhood. Also designed by Wright at the turn of the 20th century, about 20 years prior to Greycliff, the Martin House. The site for Greycliff was purchased from the owners of a neighboring property. It had not been developed and was being used as farmland. And at that point in the mid 1920s, it didn't have the tree growth you see in this more recent photo, but it did of course have the 65 foot cliff. Not only did Wright's design take care to frame views of the water and integrate exterior and interior space, but he incorporated building materials taken directly from the site as he was known to do specifically rocks, mostly Titchener limestone, directly from the cliff that had fallen to the beach below, along with sand from that same beach. What is just as incredible as the sunsets on the property is the magical feeling that Wright has created that can be experienced right around dusk and dawn when the house literally glows from within. Wright has achieved this through his use of recessed lighting using amber glass, as well as the warm yellow color of the plaster interior walls. And this picture does not do it justice. And I haven't even mentioned the actual sun yet. Wright being as thoughtful and meticulous as he was, he most certainly was well aware of the location's geographic coordinates and the relationship to the sun's path. And he designed the architecture accordingly. There is a certain corner of the main house that interacts perfectly with the setting sun in a phenomenon that happens just once a year. But before I get to that, let's talk about the corner itself. Here we are on the exterior of this part of the house where you can see the corner window. In this photo, you can also appreciate the use of limestone from the cliff. I'd like you to pay attention to that corner as we've now panned out so you can see the full lake side of the structure. The corner in discussion is on the far right. Now look to the far left and imagine that corner with the window taking up the expanse of that plane, giving a sort of symmetry with the other side of the house. That was how Wright originally designed and even executed this building. And we are now on the interior of that space, the dining room of the main house, where you can see that corner more clearly. This is two feet of space that was added after Isabel spent her first summer at her brand new summer home in 1928 and could not get this corner of the house to work for her needs. Wright moved that wall out two feet for Isabel. So the house wasn't in Wright's complete vision for long before he made this change as per Isabel's wishes. But in all honesty, that's not the special corner of the house. And I wholeheartedly believe that not only did Wright realize this, but Isabel, who is a true client of this project, did too. The corner where the magic happens was referred to as the view room for reasons that are obvious. We also call it the fern room as there is this wonderful interior planter that combined with the use of stone serves to charmingly disorient someone on the inside, confusing the interior and exterior space as Wright was known to do. We know that this was a treasured part of the house then and now. Here you can see a historic photo, likely from the early 1930s, where you can also get a glimpse into Isabel's own vision for the house. This was a space that was made comfortable and uh, definitely enjoyed by many throughout the years. What Wright was really hoping to accomplish here was to break the cube of the room, dissolve the walls and of course the corner by having the panes of glass meet seamlessly. He didn't quite get there as money and technology was not on his side. So what you see here is Wright creatively working 
with standard window hardware of the 1920s to execute his vision. Now, this is not a picture of Great Cliffs Corner Window, but what was achieved at Falling Water and several other properties where Wright truly dissolves the corner through his use of um, window frames and also his perfection of mitered glass. The whole context here is unnecessary as this photo illustrates quite well how wonderful it would have been uh, to have and open a window like this. But back to our window and the incredible thing that happens once a year. Every summer solstice in late June, when the sun is setting over the water for about a week or so, this corner window exactly frames the sun's location in the sky. Again, this picture, which I took myself, really does not do the view justice. This is a moment that I'm confident the Martin family took note of and enjoyed and that we at Great Cliff Conservancy now celebrate and see as a unique opportunity to engage people. We do this through special tours and programming. This is a photo of a sound bath timed with the setting solstice sun as one example. And last year, we had our first annual summer solstice garden party where we invited hundreds of party goers to the site to experience the magic of the setting solstice sun and this corner window in person with a glass of wine in hand to raise needed operational support for our organization. While Greycliff is open for tours year round, it particularly shines, or should I say glows, in the summer months. And it was designed and originally, as it was designed and originally enjoyed. Please seek us out when you're in town, visit us on a guided tour, come to our evening summer market or the summer solstice garden party. Thank you so much. And I hope to have the opportunity to welcome you to Greycliff very soon. Yeah, thank you so much. I so want thank to be you. there. I so want to be there. It's amazing. I'd love to have you there, Marta. <laughs> oh, how many of you be, uh, have been uh, panelists? Have you been to Great Cliff? Yes, yes, yes. Nice. Well, good. And you know, I didn't mention that um, Anna also uh, uh, manages uh, Right Virtual Visits uh, along with Eric. If, and that is a program of uh, Franklin Dried Building Conservancy. So you're going to see the pattern here. And all the panelists somehow somehow connected. So thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Q&A a little later. So if you guys have pressing questions, just put it there and we'll make sure to address it. And we're going to go to our next presenter, uh, Pat Mahoney. Um, so, uh, we, uh, first of all, I need, I need to, uh, say I'm so grateful because Pat, uh, will fill in for another speaker later for another project. So there are two very, um, fascinating projects in Buffalo. We are now moving from Greycliff uh, to filling station and a little bit about, uh, our presenter. So, uh, uh, Pat is a licensed architect and associate um, uh, at uh, the Amherst in New York based firm of Lauer Mancuso and Associates. Uh, he's, he was compelled to become an architect uh, when in 1979, he experienced Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, falling water. His inability to capture the feeling of falling water in two dimensional media led to a goal of experiencing all of Mr. Uh, Wright's extent works on a first hand basis. He accomplished that goal in 2018. These visits enabled him to meet over 15% of the original clients of Frank Lloyd Wright, as well as a number of professionals trained by Wright. Pat is a founding member of Greycliff. He also is past president and honorary lifetime board, board member of the Conservancy. Hello, Pat. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Are you ready? I am ready. Wonderful. In 1903, William and Mary Heath became Frank Lloyd Wright's first Buffalo clients. Mary Heath's nephew, Elmer E. Harris, operated an oil company in western New York that sold Tidal brand of gasoline. Harris was also acquainted with Darwin D. Martin as he lived down the street from the Martins. Darwin Martin followed the Heaths, employing Wright for his sister Delta Barton's house and then his own home in 1904. Martin Heath and two other local men acquired Harris Oil and its retail gasoline operations following the death of Elmer Harris in 1926. William Heath became the treasurer of Harris Oil and was charged with upgrading a number of antiquated filling stations they operated. Heath hired a local architect, James Walker, and suggested a Dutch colonial cottage be used as a theme for the new buildings. 
Walker had published designs for Dutch colonial homes in the local newspapers in 1922. Standard Oil, the largest supplier of gasoline nationally and Harris Oil's largest competitor, was using a colonial cottage as a model for their new stations. Meanwhile, Darwin Martin urged Wright to send Heath a prototypical plan for a new filling station. The design Wright sent incorporated a multi-level building with a large diamond window and gas bells hanging from a tubular structure cantilevered from a solid core. Heath didn't embrace the plan. When Heath presented Wright with the Walker Dutch colonial design, Wright wrote, my eyes fill with tears. He recalled that the Larkins, Heath's previous employers, used colonial themes to sell their Buffalo China, among other products. John Larkin even dressed for the part and was photographed in his colonial mansion. At Martin's urging, Wright revised his design and sent a second prototypical station to Heath. Gone were the oversized diamond windows, which were replaced by a copper roof with two totems supporting an abstracted cable-supported neon Tidal sign, as reimagined by Wright. An upper floor incorporated separate private restrooms for male and female customers, and a glass wall lounge with a wood-burning fireplace. Encouraged by a more positive response from Heath, Wright prepared a site-specific adaptation of his prototype for the pie-shaped location at Michigan and Cherry in Buffalo. This design deleted the service and retail wings because an existing greasing station on the site provided those functions already. The cantilever gas bells were to be supported by the totem post as a fulcrum with a counterbalance in the concrete core. Underground gasoline tanks were to be connected to a water tank above the fireplace. The system used water pressure to pump the gasoline from underground tanks into the suspended gas bells. This pressure was to be achieved by a connection to the water tank above the fireplace mass. Similar methods were used before the wide scale adoption of electric pumps. It was used in various locations secretly for fear that the customers would realize water was pumping their gasoline. Wright's drawings for the Michigan and Cherry Project are somewhat unusual in his archive. Here we see James Walker's initial plans for Michigan and Cherry. They've been cut into pieces and taped back together, partially reversed by Wright. The elevations of the Dutch colonial design are at the bottom and the plan including the existing greasing station are above. The reverse side shows the greasing station drawn by Walker as well as tracing paper added for Wright's design. Wright has incorporated large sunken planters on the site to direct automobiles and added a checkerboard red and white grid throughout the concrete slabs. He titled the design an ornament to the pavement. The Harris Oil Company and Wright failed to agree upon the value of his design and the commission reverted to James Walker by May of 1928. Heath never believed Wright could meet the $5,000 budget for the station's construction. Walker revised his design to include a ladies lounge on the second floor as well as, a, as separate toilets for men and women customers. A year later, uh, Mart Wright mentioned to Darwin Martin that he regretted not making an agreement with Harris. Wright continued to develop his design for a standardized filling station. In April of 1930, with little in the way of commissions, he, re he revised the design and tried to interest Skelly Oil. Wright reported in 1930 that Texaco was interested in a station. A model was built from the design, slightly revised with additional uh, grade level glazing from the Skelly version. It was exhibited in Chicago in October. Texaco failed to pursue the station either. Ray Lindholm operated service stations and built a right designed house in Cloquet, Minnesota beginning in 1952. Four years later, he was convinced to build a right designed service station. The suspended gas bills, gas, gas bills could not gain approval. The Phillips 66 station still exists today and operates under a different brand. In 2002, Transportation Museum founder in Buffalo, James Sandoro, announced he would build the Frank Lloyd Wright standardized filling station on the museum grounds. With the help of drawings located by the Buffalo Fire Department of the Walker Station, the Wright drawings of Michigan and Cherry were tied to the Buffalo site and it was designated as the design to build. Construction of the station proceeded inside an atrium addition to the museum, largely funded by the state of New York. The station structure was built as if it were outside with its originally designated materials and construction methods. Many of the craftsmen needed to complete the project had honed their skills on restorations of either the Martin House or Greycliffe. The project, a full-scale model of the station, still undergoing final work, opened to the public in September 2012. The opening was augmented by the display of Wright's 1929 cord 
generously funded by Thomas Hagen of the Erie Historical Society. Before you ask, the transportation has decided not to patina the copper roof. The museum uses the station as an elaborate prop to interpret the adoption of the automobile as one of the major influences on life in America today. The glass wall of the atrium allows view into the museum from the adjacent street level set among automobiles of the era. The station interior has been fully built out following the limited plans developed during the period Wright worked with the Harris Oil Company. Limited tours today are able to experience the spaces firsthand, but there are no fires in the two fireplaces and fuel isn't dispensed from the suspended bells. Suspended bells are a common sight at stations in Japan today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, who, who's planning a trip to Buffalo? I imagine that majority of people on this are already fully convinced that this is their next vacation. So thank you, Pat, so much. How You're exciting welcome. to have a filling station by right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. How is everyone doing so far? Good? Well, we're going to awesome. keep... We're going to keep going because uh, Pechakucha obligates us to do a beer break, which is going to be very short, but still we have to do it. So we're going to go to our next presenter and then we're going to have a little beer, beer break to chat a little and then we're going to continue. So uh, I will now introduce our next presenter, Kevin Rose. He's a historian, humanist, curator and community advocate here in Springfield, Ohio. He serves as the executive director of the Hartman Rock Garden, a visionary art environment created by the artist Ben Hartman in 1930s. Kevin also works part-time as a historian at the Turner Foundation, a family foundation focused on the revitalization of Springfield, Ohio, a, a, fo a foundation that had a tremendous impact on saving the Westcott House. So he has also something to do with it in terms of research. He'll tell you all about it. Uh, he is the past president of the Victorian Society, a fabulous uh, or a national organization, as well as past board chair of Ohio Humanities. And I know what's coming next. He's going to be like, uh, are you going to tell and? them I'm your husband? <laughs> yes, he is also my husband, my lovely husband. I think that uh, I, it's a good point to 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 share uh, his credentials first. <laughs> Uh, so you actually see he's absolutely qualified to do this presentation. Kevin, are you ready? Part of the line from John Zukowski was, I hope you two get along because you're going to be working a lot together. That was nearly 20 years ago. So we do get along. We still together. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, I'm ready. okay. I have studied the history of the Westcott House for nearly half my life, 22 years a journey that has taken me to archives from coast to coast. Houses like these hold their secrets close. Still, this house has an amazing story to tell, which starts with the story of two leaders in a city that helped to define the progressive era. Orpha Westcott was an advocate for children's health and early education. She and her best friend, Benetta Titlow, Springfield's first female surgeon, championed the creation of fresh air baby camps that were credited with cutting the infant mortality rate in half in only two years in Springfield. The camp was located on Stam Pipe Hill, just a block from the Westcott House. Her husband, Burton Westcott, was an industrialist, entrepreneur, and civic reformer. He helped to introduce the city manager form of government in Springfield, which sought to professionalize city management and corruption and graft. Springfield still employs this system over a century later. The Westcotts moved to Springfield from Richmond, Indiana in 1903 as part of a merger of the nation's five largest seeding machine manufacturers, including Westcott's Hoosier Drill Company, seen here on the right. Burton became treasurer of the new concern, which they called the American Seeding Machine Company. The company moved, or the couple moved from house to house in their first few years before deciding to purchase a piece of what American publishing magnate J.S. Kroll called the finest and most desirable residence lot in Springfield. Kroll touted the lot's elevated position next to Greenmount Cemetery, a perpetual green park which ensures freedom from smoke and dust. It was indeed the leading residence street in the city a grand thoroughfare filled with massive high style mansions like the home of Asa and Ellen Bushnell pictured here, 
which was designed by the prominent Manhattan architect Robert Henderson Robertson in 1886. The Westcats would play here, by the way, the children for birthday parties. Uh, but Bert Norfa's land was far different from the large open pastoral lots once common on East High Street. It measured just 75 feet wide and 290 feet long, with provisions for a shared alley to the rear. The land of the West would soon be filled with the Hoppus House, a friend of the Westcots, and the land behind was filled with small wood-framed cottages. The Perpetual Green Park, described in the advertisement, was actually a neglected and soon-to-be-condemned cemetery, and fresh air seemed to be and seemed unlikely given the close proximity to one of America's largest industrial centers, shown here at the top. The Westcott House would later occupy the land in the middle of this photo. But Burton and Orpha were no fools. They would have known the commercial club's yet-to-be-announced plans to engage George Kessler, then one of the nation's leading landscape architects, to envision this city filled with parks and tree-lined boulevards, and most importantly, a plan to exhume over a thousand bodies from Greenmount Cemetery next door and turn it into a park. It is in the midst of this rapidly transforming industrial city that Burton and Norfolk Westcott decided to introduce a house by an architect that needs no introduction. And not just because it's impossible to sum up Frank Lloyd Wright in only 20 seconds. It was Wright's first house in Ohio and the only from the first half century of his career in the state of Ohio. The couple may have learned about Wright from this Ladies Home Journal article in February 1901. In it, Wright wrote, the exterior recognizes the influence of the prairie, is firmly and broadly associated with the site, and makes a feature of its quiet level. I love those last words, its quiet level. The Ladies Home Journal plan, shown reversed in the cross section above, connects, with the house, connects the house's library, living room, and dining room in one large space, rooms within a larger room. The same arrangement is present in nearly every proposal that Burton and Orville Westcott reviewed during the design process. In 1907, after the couple had scrapped a series of designs, Wright proposed what would be his final concept. The design was symmetrical, with a terrace and small pool in the front. The broad, cantilever, the broad roof cantilevered over two large sleeping porches on either side. In front, Wright placed two large urns, the largest used on any of his residential projects, which would become the house's most distinguishing feature. Wright placed a garage at the rear of the property, a, novel, a novelty itself in a world where the term horsepower did not yet refer to the automobile. This same year, Burton decided to create the Westcott Motor Car Company. The company's earliest prototype was surely the garage's first resident. The Westcott house was nearly complete by the early summer of 1908. A photographer thankfully captured this interior image of the house then under construction. Here, Inglenook benches surround the fireplace, creating the room within a room that I showed in the earlier cross section. Stepping further into this space, the photographer captured this image of the yet to be completed dining room. The sideboard is a fantastic example of Wright's ability to create beauty through a simplicity of line and shape. It is also a far departure from the ornate sideboards in neighboring homes with carved images of dead animals or large scallop shelves that symbolize the family's wealth. Missing from the photo, of course, is Wright's custom designing uh, dining table with built-in art glass lamps, which provided the room's only artificial light. The table is surrounded with Wright's signature high back chairs, six in a regular setting or eight with the extension added. Orpha liked to put flowers in the small nooks under each one of the lamps. The architect and clients opted for an expansive views out onto the future Greenmount Park, which sadly would never come to fruition. Voters, most of whom were still dealing with the effects of the Panic of 1907, rejected the commercial club's park plan by a vote of nearly two to one. While some locals mistook the house for a menagerie during construction, the community seemed to celebrate the completed work. The newspaper called it a most original and charming house. When asked about the style, Burton Westcott replied, I asked that question to the architect and he said, it's really a Frank Wright type. The Westcotts would call it their home for nearly 18 years. Today, the Westcott house stands as a testament to Burton and Orpha's bold vision. In their spirit, we continue to use it as a classroom to inspire young minds, as a gathering place for people to share big ideas, as a canvas for artistic expression, and as a place for quiet reflection on how the past continues to shape our future. Thanks. Yay, Westcott. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. I'm actually at the Westcott house currently, if you don't see this. That dining, not. there it is. There's a, do you have little flowers underneath the, underneath the <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. I think uh, um, you, uh, you earned us a beer break. So we're going to uh, go to this is officially beer break if any if anyone Woo! step aside we're gonna like take three minutes uh, max because we want to keep going we don't want to lose anyone so um uh, any question here we are officially <laughs> thank you brian how are we doing i i'm <laughs> that scene in the matrix when like they pull the thing from neo's head and he's like now I know Kung Fu. I just feel like I just downloaded an immense amount of Frank Lloyd Wright knowledge. And uh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty invigorated. <laughs> this is, beautiful. It's pretty intense. It It, it is so much, uh, so much uh, jammed into those uh, presentations. It's amazing like... stories. I mean, I, another thing I thought, Kevin, your voice, you know, I can see a podcast, a Frank Lloyd Wright <laughs> podcast in your not so distant future. I would listen to this all the time. <laughs> A face for radio? Is that what you're saying, Brian? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Everybody, for that matter. It's just, it's, I mean, how, you know, now that we're adding these presentations to this archive of knowledge that we have, I mean, it, it's really, uh, you know, a great, I would like to sit in a classroom and listen to, you know, a back-to-back -back, uh, marathon of these presentations. You'd gain so much information and uh, I'm really just, thank you, everybody. Really enjoy myself. I'm sure I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody in the all 200 of us in the chat here, too, and online and all our, our all our attendees and all of us who are watching over on YouTube. Yes, it's I mean, I, we're, I'm very much enjoying myself. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes, we had. Uh, so, uh, you know, the beauty, I think, is uh, that you you do uh, collect these uh, as individual presentations and it's so easy to find those. Uh, and it, it's just kind of like, you know, I think I think of it as. A beautiful archive of of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's work and his impact on uh, all these people who connect through public sites and also have a chance to see some um, some private um, uh, projects uh, through through organizations such as Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy. So it's amazing, and these will be shared following this uh, you know uh, this event. We had uh, over four hundred people register tonight. Uh, so uh, we will make sure that those who register will receive a link, but also, of course, it will live on on social media and and pachakucha.org. Marta, um, I see that it appears you left the Westcott House off the list of site houses that are in the in the line of totality. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know what? We, we, <laughs> it's funny. We, <laughs> this is about other houses, wasn't it? Yes. We, we, I guess we sharing it from Westcott perspective. I'm so, yes, Westcott is absolutely, we, there was a we, comment on it. We, we deserve to be in this, uh, in this evening because we are indeed in path of totality. So, <laughs> and I wanted to show, I think, Brian, we have some slides about um, some speaking of solar eclipse. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge, uh, oh, of course, you know, anytime we take, we take support from you. So make the volume seven happen. If you can uh, take uh, the, the scan that, that uh, QR code and it will be, uh, you can, any donation of any level matters to get us going. And uh, by the I'm way, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it for just two more seconds, Martha, just so everybody can get their phone out <laughs> and get the QR code. I'm not going to rush off to the next slide just too quickly. Please, everybody, thank you so much for contributing to uh, making our volume seven of this happen. Do take out your cell phone and get your QR code app open and do take a uh, uh, screen so that we can continue this amazing collaboration. OK. Thank you, Marta, for letting me linger on that a little oh, bit. Thank you. Thank you. So here are some examples. It's really fun. So we, um, uh, the graphic that you see there, uh, and you saw also the purple version that kind of uh, uh, synthesized some of the designs. That was, uh, we collaborated, Greycliff and Westcott collaborated with, uh, with uh, Eric O'Malley. Uh, who's an amazing graphic designer. He actually wears many, many hats, but he, uh, for this purpose, he designed this to celebrate solar eclipse. And as you can see, Grey Clip some, has some really cool t-shirts. So check it out. You can buy it online. 
Um, and I think we also have um, uh, announcement there about upcoming event. Uh, Anna mentioned the uh, summer solstice, so uh, check it out. I, I I would love to be there for that. That's such a great experience. So June twenty second, and. Um, we also uh, have a couple examples of uh, so so we have Westcott has some uh, uh, merchandise as well for the for the project we we invited our members and volunteers to join us on Monday uh, the actual day of of uh, to uh, total solar eclipse if you available and you don't have plans uh, uh, the the Westcott Gardens are your place. Uh, and uh, by the way, this is uh, on a, uh, the the blue design is by Eric O'Malley. On, uh, on the left side, we have um, our longtime collaborator, uh, Andy Hayes of Hackleback Design Studio based here in Springfield. He, uh, he uh, created this uh, super cool t-shirts for us. So again, check our shops and support these public sites. They need your support and, uh, and, uh, and uh, get yourself ready for this uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic natural occurrence. So, any questions? Any anything that's on your mind before we move on to the next next presenter? I I like to see Frank Lloyd Wright in sunglasses and and the three and the and the the solar eclipse glasses. He looks like um, he looks quite cool. You know, he looks like a punk. <laughs> he looks a little bit punkish. I was going to say, Marta, I love your merch and I've got to get myself a t-shirt because Great Clip, we've sold, already sold out in a couple of the sizes. So I, I've got to, I've got to get that t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, we, we call it two forces of nature because of course, frankly, <laughs> tried and solar eclipse. That's the only thing that came to our mind. How Marta said, is that too cheesy? And I said, no, you got to be cheesy sometimes. Yeah, sure. Why not? Right. So yeah, it's um, it's just fun. Uh, it's just fun to think about those things. And as a matter of fact, you know, it it really pushed us to think about again, uh, do some uh, science related uh, projects with kids. As you may know, Westcott has also solar powered home on our property, so it's our classroom, and we're doing some kind of steam activities, which is really really fun. So, well, are we all ready then? Yes. Beer break okay. over. Okay, well, we're going to move on again. Um, everyone, if you want to leave any questions uh, in Q&A, we'll take care of it after the presentation. So um, and our next presenter uh, is Megan McElfresh, um, McElfresh, McElfresh, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, so Megan uh, is coming to us uh, representing uh, stained glass, the Stained Glass Association of America. Uh, she, which is amazing, she's a third generation stained glass artisan with background in nonprofit and operation management and art history. So she leads uh, the Stained Glass Association of America, the group that I believe was formed in 1903, right? And uh, by a group of, uh, of stained glass craftsmen to promote and protect the art of architectural stained glass. How wonderful is that? Her leadership comes an exciting time as the organization celebrates 120 years of service to the industry and revital, 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 oh my goodness, and carries its mission for the next generation. And in you, I, you have also your own architectural stain, uh, glass studio, right? Um, I did. Now I mostly teach. <laughs> oh, oh yes. So it. So many connections. It's only natural that you lead this wonderful organization, and we so appreciate that you you took time to share with with us um, uh, about this particular aspect of of Wright's work. Thank you so much. Are you ready? Happy to be here. I'm ready. Thank you so much. When you stand and gaze at a stained glass window. You are seeing and feeling the many hands that work to create that installation. You are seeing the steadiness of the breath of the glass blower, the cast and stretch and pull of a glass caster, and the marks of every hand that has been a part of the process of cutting, grinding, and manipulating that material, piecing it together into a mosaic of light. You are feeling community. You're feeling nature. Glass is sand and a mixture of elements transformed by heat. 
but it's through the wisdom of the hands crafting it, the master artisan, the engineer, the scientist, that makes this material magic. Stained glass has been a part of the fabric of our lives for over 1300 years, inspiring us, bringing light inside on even the grayest of days, or even during a total eclipse. I have given hundreds of tours and I have never met anyone that hates stained glass. Art glass, lead lights, beveled transoms, whatever you call it, this mosaic of light transforms our spaces. Stained glass is the art of light. It is the mastery of atmosphere. And in a world of machinery and mass production, it is an art form that remains wholly impossible without the hand of the maker embedded in absolutely every piece and every step of the creative process. Each time the glass blower adjusts or pushes their breath or touches the molten gather with a tool, it leaves a mark. Once cooled, the glass will be gilded or ground, etched or painted or stained by several other people before it is carefully fit into lead channel and then mounted into a sash in the light. Even working as an independent artist, I rely on many other skilled hands to build my work. There is no other way. When made by great craftspeople, the marks and details of all these hands become less and less obvious to the eye, allowing us as viewers to resonate fully with the piece within its architectural setting. As a viewer, you get to then experience stained glass as a wholly active event. Light is never still. The atmosphere is ever changing. Whether we can consciously perceive that constant movement or not, the earth is hurtling through space at 67,000 miles per hour, spinning on its axis at 1,000 miles per hour. No matter how many times you come back to a space and pause at that window, you will never experience the exact same piece twice. As a creator, the hardest part of building each stained glass window, even if it is all clear, is mastering the material, knowing that light is in constant flux. Everything around the window I am building has an impact, and I must build the window on a solid surface, often without any light transmission at all. A light box is not the sun, and I'm rarely lucky enough to be able to prop my creation up in a window that matches the final direction that the window will be facing when it's installed. And the conditions are certainly not the same, so you must understand how each individual piece of glass within the entire window matrix will be affected by every other piece of glass, by the time of day, by the seasons, by the shadows cast, by every other structure and growing tree nearby. And because we as artists strive to understand that, sometimes it means we end up head to head with an architect or two because we know that they really, really, really don't want that shade of blue. They want this other one. The years of practice and experience it takes to become great at this historic trade is as much about learning the physics of light and atmosphere as it is about mastering the repetitive skills that will eventually become muscle memory and then trusting that experience and building on it year after year after year. Then the scaffolding goes up, the window is installed, and I am gone. In my experience, it is rare to even be able to stay and witness the work for a full day. I've lost track of the number of times I finished an install well after dark and had to wait years for another opportunity to circle back to a location when the building is open to see the work in daylight. If I'm lucky, the community will send me some great photographs once in a while of the window being enjoyed. That's really the ultimate part of the creative process, the human experience we leave behind, the memories and stories that build over generations. I don't think twice about whether or not anyone knows I've built the work I've installed. Many of my favorite pieces are anonymous. The studios that have lasted for generation after generation in this industry have a passion for service, and an ability to set aside their own ego to build for a greater community. Our work must stand the test of time. We are a part of the fabric that makes up the entire building, working alongside master masons and carpenters. 
The best work should look effortless. And if we've done our job right, if I've done my job right, we can see all of that when we look at stained glass, whether we are aware of it or not. There's some concern here in Buffalo that on the day of the eclipse, the day will dawn cloudy and overcast. I wouldn't mind. I'll be honest, I'd rather be inside. The hardest part will be choosing which inside. This is Buffalo, so we've got options. Then I could experience in real time the life in the day of a window, a real time time lapse of the sunset and sunrise, a process of monumental shifting within a window that normally takes hours and happens so gradually it's barely perceptible will happen in a matter of moments. Great Tiffany and Lamb and Connick and Frank Lloyd Wright windows will spill their secrets. Cities will emerge from the clouds and then disappear again. On a normal day, you'd have to sit quietly without moving all day to see every nuance of that transformation. So if it da dawns cloudy on eclipse day, just find some stained glass and settle in for a light show passed down to us from generations past. Oh, took my breath away. <laughs> oh, wow. and the comments, you should make sure to read comments. People love, as you said, people love stained glass. And you made it so special. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to the next presenter. And then we're going to circle back to Megan and everyone to, to, to have a little celebration. So... Um, I will now go to introduce um, Gani Harbo. Um, he is a, an internationally recognized architect dedicated to the conservation of the world's cultural heritage. He has over 35 years of experience and runs his uh, own Chicago-based firm, Harbo Architects, with a focus on preservation and sustainable design. He has worked on many iconic modern masterpieces, including numerous works by Mies van der Rohe, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Louis Sullivan. Recent projects include national historic landmarks such as Thalys in West, Robbie House, Unity Temple, and Beth Shalom Synagogue, as well as other architects such as Mies van der Rohe's Crown Hall, Louis Sullivan's Carson Peary Scott Store, Halliburton's and Rush Marquette Building, all those are just uh, uh, taking your breath away, all those buildings. It's fascinating that you managed to work on these projects, uh, on all of these. He's a past board member of the Franklin Tride Building Conservancy. We are so honored to have you. And if you're ready to go, we will start. All right, let's hit it. Wonderful. So I want to uh, share with you a very brief overview of a master plan that was created for the Dallas Theater Center for the restoration of the uh, Khalid Humphreys Theater that was headed up by Diller Scafidio and Renfro, Harbor Architects as Preservation Architects, and Reed Hildebrand as Landscape Architects. The Khalid Humphreys Theater was one of Wright's last projects. It was contemporaneous with the Guggenheim and Beth Shalom, and he never saw it completed. He uh, got the commission in 1955 and visited the site at that time and met with Paul Baker, who was the director of the newly formed Dallas Theater Center. I guess with other building types, Wright had had an idea of a theater in his mind for 40 years before he got this opportunity. And the new theater design, as he called it, was originally conceived of as for Woodstock, New York in 1931, and again for Hartford, Connecticut in 48. They were very similar to this final design. This aligned quite well with what Paul Baker's interest was in new ideas about theater that he'd been developing at Baylor's Drama School. Even though they didn't agree on everything, uh, it was Wright's design that went out. One of the main constraints was the very small size of the lot, and it compressed it along the sides, which meant that some of the functional aspects were not optimal. Here you can see the building uh, originally completed in 59, along with how it looks today. And the big change was filling in the upper level terrace, which turned it was turned into some practice space, which was much needed. From below, uh, as you approach in a car or on foot, the building looks very much as it did since 1959. So very little change. But you can also notice 
that one big issue about the loading and unloading was was very difficult and inadequate. It's really on the inside that most of the changes uh, occurred, and there is a desire to undo these and to put it back, restore it to what it once was. Most drastically, the change of colors, the seating, the uh, lighting that's hanging down, and the whole rake of the floor was raised uh, back in the 1980s. These diagrams uh, that you see next are showing the original, the original design on the left and on the right the lower level with uh, additional bathrooms that were put in. And the idea is to get back to this as closely as possible. However, by uh, changing the design or going back to the original design, there's a need for additional lobby space because the lobby was inadequate at originally and that's why they added on to it and now it would be even more so. So they are uh, putting on an addition and they're connecting it to two new buildings that I'll show you in a, in a moment. As we always do on our projects, uh, after we've spent a good time getting to understand the history and the significance of the site, we zone the building so that everybody can come to terms with what's important what needs to be preserved, what needs to be restored, and uh, how you understand the way you can make your interventions. We also look at it to see how what the levels of integrity are, because the, the original significance may be compromised by later changes. As you can see here, the blue of the theater itself is indicating a, a low level integrity because of the way that it had been changed over time. This shows the uh, main approach, the restoration, which is basically removing this later 1960s addition uh, that completely changed the way it looks from the outside. And it also changed the way that it functions on the inside. So that the idea is that the, the building itself will be brought back to what it was in 1959. Here you show that shows the original theater. And uh, the, the main thing about this whole design was that it was a theater not quite in the round, but where you were on stage and you were really part of the audience. This was a huge change from the way that people thought about theaters. And this was something that excited both Wright and Paul Baker, that they wanted to use this as a way to do experimental theater and to do traditional theater like Shakespearean theater, uh, which is more geared to this kind of a thing. One of the main problems with it is the low rake of the seating. You can see how there's virtually no rake in that image. And uh, Fisher Dax, who was uh, Joe Scafidi and Renfro's consultant on this, they did a lot of studies to show how the original design was very inadequate with a lot of bad viewing, uh, viewing area. That's the blue area you see here. And they played around with how could that be improved, which meant that in order to really improve the rake, get rid of that raised floor that they had put in, uh, you can see here now you can finally see the floor, but it required dropping the, the concrete slab of the floor uh, slightly so that th this could accommodate a better viewing, viewing, uh, better viewing. And this has obviously structural implications. Uh, Silman, the, our, the, the structural engineers that worked on Guggenheim were also engaged here. And here you can see the area that would need to be removed and rebuilt. Also, the blue elevators on the right, that's something that Wright didn't want. He thought you could do it all with those ramps, but that actually never did work. So it was good that they had added uh, that freight elevator when they did at the end of the project originally. Here you see the overview of the site with the theater in the middle. Uh, this is the park that it sits in. The Katy Trail is that linear path on the top of the slide. And... Uh, it's a beautiful area, but it has a lot of parking and roads in it, and the hope is to reduce that significantly. This you can't possibly read in 20 seconds, but it shows the many different versions that DSNR went through to find a solution, which ends up being the one on the right with the, the Kalita Humphrey in the middle and several new buildings that are incorporated uh, in sort of a, um, uh, a series of buildings, almost like uh, a charm bracelet with the Kalita Humphreys being in the center and fully restored and beautiful. And there are other buildings that are sort of kept a bit away so that you can just experience the Kalita Humphrey the way it always had been intended. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. This is very important because also I understand that there is uh, there is a, a lot of effort to to really uh, not only uh, save and preserve this site, uh, but also of course restore it properly. Uh, and that process is still underway, right? Yeah, they're they're looking for the money now. <laughs> money. They need a lot of it. They need a lot. Always of it. comes down to the money. <laughs> Well, hey guys out there, if you have some money to spare, this is your project. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing how, um, you know, I, I, I just sometimes feel like how, how can we as a society let those things uh, go, right? And, and uh, so that's where I really value the Conservancy's efforts to really focus uh, on those uh, properties and, and make sure that uh, no more... Uh, right buildings uh, get um, uh, get sacrificed in the name of uh, new development. So thank you, Gani, so much. And again, questions in Q&A, and we're going to move to Chris now. Uh, so um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker in Erie, Pennsylvania. So uh, we, we continue to operating back and forth in a path of totality. Uh, so... Chris is Director of Collections and Archives at the Hagen History Center in Erie, Pennsylvania. He has 25 years of experience as an educator, a librarian, and athlete, athletic coach, which is a fabulous combination. Um, he was a professor and coach at Berkeley College in Kansas. Kansas. Uh, he taught history and religion courses as an adjunct instructor for several uni universities and seminaries in the New York City area. He has a PhD in American Religion and Culture from Drew University, a Master of Library and Information Science from Syracuse University, and a Master of Divinity with an emphasis on the history of Christianity from Asbury Theological Seminary. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for being here, and uh, we start whenever you're ready. It's a pleasure, Marta. Thank you. We'll, we'll go ahead. All right. It's a pleasure to represent the Hagen History Center located in Erie, Pennsylvania. We are home of Frank Lloyd Wright's original San Francisco, California office. This was a satellite office where he worked from 1951 until the time of his death in 1959. He collaborated on the construction of this office with partner Aaron G. Green. Wright's office was located at 319 Grant Street in San Francisco on the second floor of the rent, this rented building on the left. In later years, the office expanded to the floors above it. While this was not a building that Wright designed himself, its large windows were a perfect backdrop for his office and looked very similar to the windows that he designed in some of his commissions. Wright and his partner, Aaron Green, who is pictured at left, collaborated on many projects and became friends before agreeing to work together in California. Green designed a simple sketch of, uh, for the space and Wright added details. Green and Atelier son apprentice built the office themselves. This is a copy of the sketch uh, design of the San Francisco office. The handwritten notes exemplify, I think, the intentionality, um, the time, and the work that went into the design of this space. The office entrance reveals Wright's 120 degree angle geometrical designs in native Californian redwood with partial walls and louvered wood and textured glass designs. The windows duplicate the exterior street scene that visitors would have viewed through the windows. This view provides another look at the entrance and the open design of the space. The office secretary who would have sat in the foreground at left, could see the architects and the drafting tables while guests could only see movement and activity through the textured windows. And those are located on the right. After Wright's death, Green used the office until 1988. It was disassembled and then went through a series of owners, uh, including Tom Monaghan of, of, Domino's, of the Domino's Pizza chain, it also through uh, Jim Sandoro of the Transportation Pierce Aero Museum in Buffalo. Uh, it and then it was eventually stored uh, and, and, and purchased uh, by Tom Hagen, our patron. Most people ask, why Erie? 
We are centrally located about 90 minutes between Wright sites in Buffalo and Pittsburgh, and you could also add Ohio for those of you uh, on that on that part of the journey. Uh, we're on a main highway route and uh, visitors travel to reach these sites. Jan Novi was Aaron Green's protege and worked in the office for 20 years. He visited our office in Erie uh, recently and shared that he, quote, had a transcendental experience and felt like he was back in time in San Francisco. It's the best of right, he claimed. The exhibit space outside the Frank Lloyd Wright office includes additional tributes to Wright and his architecture, along with one of the hot shots, a replica of the fleet of vehicles that Talies on apprentices drove. Now we can venture back inside the drafting room and you can take, take note of the ceiling, the windows, the 120 degree walls of the reconstructed office space on our campus. These elements are feature, features that Wright enthusiasts will see in many homes and buildings that Wright designed, and we've seen a lot of those tonight. The animal skins on the three-legged stools are something Wright felt reminded him of the natural setting of Talies on West. During our grand opening in 2021, visitors examined plans drawn specifically for homes and commercial buildings that Frank Lloyd Wright and Aaron Green designed within this space. And during the grand opening, visitors enjoyed immersing themselves within the office space and viewing replicas of the original hand-drawn architecture plans. This photograph shows several of the people who worked in the office during the 1950s, and we have them on the wall of the office, and they exemplify, I think, the detail that has been duplicated by our Erie-based architectural team, right down to the ceiling heights and the window vent above the partial walls. This additional photo from the 1950s shows another side of the room that leads to a hallway and to Wright's private office. While the public spaces are open expanses, the hallway to Wright's office is much smaller, a much smaller space incorporating his compression and release philosophy. Inside Wright's private inner office, viewers note that the small space includes many of Wright's private possessions and gifts, including artwork and gifts that were on display. So the space includes a music box, a teapot, a handmade curtain, and low seating is also a, a charming detail from that era uh, in, in the office. While Wright worked in the office, he designed the largest and smallest of his architectural commissions there. The smallest was a charming doghouse. The doghouse, known as Eddie's House, was designed in 1957 to match the Robert Berger family house in St. Anselmo, California. The Marin County Civic Center was Wright's largest public project. It was also his last commission. It included a series of campus buildings and a circular post office. You can see in the photo there. It was Wright's only commission that, that I'm aware of for a national US government facility. These text and photo panels that we've added to the wall in the original office provide historical context to two of the commissions and of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's work. And we've had several high school students comment that this is helpful for help to help them contextualize the, the space themselves as they as they tour the space. We also have an original porcelain covered fascia panel from the Clinton Walker House uh, in Carmel Point, California. The panel and its history were interesting to family members of the homeowners who had traveled to our site to see the office. Wright fans from all over the world visit us regularly, including a group from Australia who uh, will visit us a second time this coming May. Well, thanks for tuning into our presentation of the re relocation and reconstruction of the original Frank Lloyd Wright San Francisco office on exhibit here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Please consider planning a visit to see us at the Hagen History Center. Uh, we're open year round Tuesday through Sunday. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank um, you, Mark. Thanks everyone. Someone just said it's so nice to get an insight into the office and and uh, see this this work and and connections uh, associated with it. So mm -hmm. now we have a field trip from Dallas to uh, Ohio to Erie, Pennsylvania to Buffalo. Here you go, and it's it's quite a, it's quite a trip. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we are on our final uh, presentation. We're gonna go to Pat, and uh, after that, if you want to, if you could stick around, we're gonna have some questions. Uh, so um, let me. Uh, well, 
this presenter needs no introduction uh, because you already heard from him about filling station. So Pat Mahoney was so kind to uh, to do this uh, presentation on yet another amazing uh, uh, project uh, really, uh, associated with Buffalo community. So Pat, whenever you're ready, um, we will start. Okay, go ahead. In November of 1905, Frank Lloyd Wright was engaged to design a supplementary boathouse for the University of Wisconsin's Rowing Club in Madison, Wisconsin. Cudworth By, the student manager of the group, was from Oak Park, Illinois. By's family was acquainted with Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright eagerly accepted the commission. The location for the boathouse was remote from the university and was on a new, the newly improved Yahara River. The Yahara connected Lakes Monona and Mendota. The depth of the river would allow for use when other areas were still frozen, and its isolation meant for more calm waters for rowing. Wright's design was for a two-story building with a broad cantilevered tar and gravel flat roof. It was to be constructed of hemlock framing and stucco walls. Its band of windows on the upper level were to be diamond leaded glass. It first, its first story featured small square windows high on the wall to preserve privacy and had oversized doors to carry eight-person shells to the floating piers. The second floor also incorporated two sizable open decks, which each featured skylights to naturally, uh, naturally light the first floor for shell overhaul. Four chimneys were included to allow stove installation at each end of the floor, the only apparent heating. The first floor, the top half of this drawing, was intended to be a wide open room with a stair serving the second floor at each end. Although drawn with two floating piers, historian Jack Holtzheater unearthed the correspondence that indicated that there was only room for one of the docks on the site provided. Holtzheater published much of the groundbreaking research on this project. The upper floor had a central lounging room with access to the flanking balconies. It also featured locker, dressing, and shower rooms at each end, one of which Wright noted could be added later if the funding was its issue, which it was. The project met a number of hurdles and was never constructed in Wisconsin. Wright considered this one of his most significant works and included it in his Wasmuth portfolio in 1910. The project as published was nearly identical to the initial scheme and shared the spotlight with some of Wright's most celebrated designs, including the Larkin Administration Building and the Heath and Martin Houses. The design was resurrected in 1930 with bold new renderings destined for display at the 1931 Berlin Exhibition. The frame and stucco structure was reimagined as a reinforced concrete edifice that would entrance modern architects of the day. The design was incorrectly dated at 1902. In September of 1997, John Corton, the executive director of the Martin House Restoration Corporation and an avid rower became aware of the Yahara Boathouse design. Corden was reportedly jumping up and down regarding the find. After a search for partners and suitable sites, a location near Buffalo's 1926 Peace Bridge was selected. The Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation licensed the design to Frank Lloyd Wright's Rowing Boathouse Corporation. Architect and former Wright apprentice Tony Putnam of Taliesin Associated Architects oversaw the final design and construction of the project. The 1930 scheme was selected to build in concrete. Funding for the endeavor was completed with a major grift, uh, gift from rowing and architecture enthusiast Charles Fontana, as well as his family. It is currently used by the West Side Rowing Club and now known as Frank Lloyd Wright's Fontana Boathouse. This is the boathouse as seen from across the Niagara River's Black Rock Channel. The channel water level can fluctuate with various wind conditions substantially, which is why the floating pier system was used. A view upwards through the roof, penetrations that house the pennant bearing flagpoles, the concrete finish continues on the soffits of the building, which has integral recessed lighting and venting. Tony Putnam believed that a prefabricated concrete would have a better finish, and thus this was done, something we didn't do with the filling station, although the same recommendation was made. Here's the interior view of the Fontana Boathouse first floor. The shell is being removed from the wall brackets designed to store the thin hulled boat. Note the outside wall of the building with wood frame skylights above, 
as well as the sphere lighting selected by Tony Putnam. Uh, the interior of this uh, space was described by Holseater as a barn, but uh, Tony dressed it up a bit. Another interior view of the first floor of the boathouse. At the far side of the full height doors that carry the shells out to the water, uh, they need to turn them sideways to get them out, somewhat uh, been somewhat criticized. Adjacent to the doors is the enclosure of the stairs leading to the second floor. On the second floor, the central lounge room is often used for public functions, uh, as well as lectures and meetings. The diamond glazing was rendered by Wright in the earliest schemes. Diamond pane glazing was often used as a less expensive alternative to art glass by Wright. This view overlooks the balcony and the black rock channel side of the structure. Diamond pane glazing on the second floor looks outward toward the balcony at sunset. This was also used in the David House due to budget constraints. That was in 1908. The diamond pane has a vertical orientation. The Davidson House in 1908 was the first to execute horizontally oriented diamond panes. The Black Rock Channel and the lake are visible beyond. That, that's the Canadian shore. The second floor viewing balcony facing the water. Note the flush mounted skylights that allow foot traffic on the balconies and daylighting to the shell room below. Clear glass has been added to the design of the balcony parapets to comply with modern code requirements. Uh, surprisingly, not many variations were needed in order to make this building comply with code. Finally, the partial eclipse of the sunset beyond Frank Lloyd Wright's Fontana Boathouse. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Pat, for doing uh, for doing us such amazing favor, and and obviously you have all the knowledge and background to to do both presentations and more. So we are so thankful to all of you. Uh, now it's time for questions. So uh, let's uh, let's go to Q and A. And by the way, thank you because there were a number of questions already answered uh, via Q and A. And I believe all the participants can see those questions um, and also answers from our speakers. So thank you for uh, staying on top of that. So um, let's see. Um, uh, Kieran, by the way, hi Kieran. She was our presenter last year, I think, or two years ago. Uh, so you. Kieran is asking about the Larkin administration building and how it was heated. Do you do you happen to know how what was the heating system at the Larkin? No, <laughs> <laughs> I can look it up in my book. <laughs> Good, goodwill, <laughs> positivity and goodwill, yes. I believe it was heated through the central heating plant that the entire Larkin plant shared. And those tunnels okay. that connect to the site still exist. We broke into one recently when we were building a daycare center in the factory building. Huh. Define broke into, because we are... <laughs> We are well, live internationally right now. We we needed to put toilets in, and we jackhammered through the floor and wound up in a tunnel. Oh, nice! At ten o'clock oh. on a Sunday night, and needed to pump out sixty thousand gallons of water oh before God. eight a.m. to mm -hmm. see if there was something in the tunnel. There wasn't. Oh, oh my goodness! Goonies. So, do you happen to know? There is question from Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen. A, I was told that Humphreys was originally designed for uh, Aileen Barnsdall uh, to be the centerpiece of her artist community on Olive Hill in Los Angeles. Uh, never realized there, uh, Wright pulled out the plans for Dallas. Is that is that true? Well, he did he did a he did a plan for Barnsdall that was a little bit different. I believe that one had a proscenium of sorts. But that's when he started thinking about theaters. He also did a theater for the uh, uh, Imperial Hotel had a theater in it. It wasn't quite this, but it was his concept of the new theater. And if you noticed in the original, the first images that I showed, the renderings of the Kalita, that she, it's called the new theater. So his, this idea, he liked to call it the new theater. And I believe the first version of that 
design was for this Woodstock, New York in 31, and it was then resurrected and morphed a little bit for the one that he did for uh, Connecticut and Hartford. And so he basically had this thing in his head, which he did, you know, did that with the, with the, what became Beth Shalom. He did it with other things. So uh, when given the opportunity, he took the same design and then squished it down to fit on this very narrow site uh, in Dallas. What an amazing design. Um, did, um, uh, there is question also for you, Gani. Do you know where black and white photo of, uh, of the theater model on the grounds at Taliesin came from? Uh, well, the, the the models I showed, neither one of those is Kalina. That I believe that the one, I have to look it up to tell you for sure. But okay. I believe the the one, the, there were two mo two images. Uh, one was the new theater for uh, Woodstock, New York, and the other one was the new theater for Hartford. But I can't remember. I can't see it in front of me now, so I can't remember which one was which. But anyway, that's what those were. There's there he did a model for both of those projects. And their photographs of those, where they got them, I'm, I don't, I don't know that I can remember that. I have to look it up. And there are well, a couple. Can, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say I can answer that first question from uh, Peter Story oh. about the simplicity of the Westcott windows. Yes. <clears throat> so the question is, why are um, the the windows so simple at Westcott House versus other prairie houses? One is money. Uh, simply, uh, easy. Uh, some of the early designs, uh, Wright was envisioning uh, leaded glass, uh, art glass windows for the Westcott House. But the more complex answer is uh, when he returned from Japan from his 1905 trip, he started designing a number of structures that had these windows. I think Westcott is the, is the best of them that uh, um, replicate or, or imply the idea of the Soji screen. Um, at Westcott, it goes from windows, uh, clear glass windows, into art glass windows, into just the pergola screen, and it's one continuous screen like you would see in a Soji temple. Um, and I was actually, in my talk, I had slides really focused on this, but it's amazing how short six minutes and 40 seconds are. Uh, so those slides got pulled out uh, because they seemed like they were a tangent, although I love tangents. <laughs> um, so I pulled those out and I have them um, residing on my computer somewhere that looked at the evolution of those windows and, and how important they were. But if you look, there's a number of designs from 1906, 07 and 08 that Wright used those windows. And speaking of windows, there is um, a comment here or question or rather comment. The windows in a boathouse are similar to a few windows in a home and studio in Oak Park. Pat, would you agree? that it's somewhat similar. Uh, I know there are some beautiful, simple uh, windows in that once you enter that home. Yeah, uh, I think the, the the vertical diamond pane window was a common theme used in many houses and they were fairly uh, inexpensive compared to art glass. So with the, the Yahara project, they were, uh, it, they were on a very tight budget. I think they only raised $1,500 to build the building. So they, they weren't able to build it with that. But Wright knew that it was going to be a, a tough uh, uh, process to raise the money. There had been some problems in the university. They weren't going to support the project. It was all coming from private individuals. One of the interesting things is if you look in uh, Guides to American Architecture, there's a design, for those of you that are not architecture geeks like some of us, there's a design that's influenced by Wright called the Prairie Box, where architects were attempting to take Wright's concepts and apply them to what is basically an American Foursquare. And one of the classic elements of the prairie box design that were really common across Midwestern communities is that diamond shaped window that architects were taking that diamond shaped out of some of Wright's designs and putting them up in, in the upper um, uh, dormers coming off the, the roof or in the, uh, the top sash on second floor windows. Uh, so if you see those when you're traveling around Chicago or other communities, you certainly see them in Springfield. Actually, the home that Marta and I own uh, directly out our window here is a prairie box home. Uh, that originally had that that style of window. And there was a question from uh, Kevin uh, Roberts, how we, how we can access the recording. So uh, everyone who's on this Zoom will receive a link. Uh, we'll make sure of that. And we will also have um, uh, links on, of course, pechakucha.org, pechakucha.com. And uh, Westcott will have also a link. So um, 
let's see. We have um, a question. What was uh, when was right in San Francisco? When did the Hagen Center move to Erie? To Erie, sorry. Um, Chris, what was the year? So the yeah, so the office represents um, his time in 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 and out of San Francisco in the 1950s until his until his passing in 59. Um, we uh, Thomas Hagen, who is our sort of our significant benefactor, uh, and the the History Center is is named after Thomas Hagen. Uh, he purchased uh, the office from uh, Jim uh, Sandoro of Buffalo uh, and. Moved it to Erie in 20, I think it was 2016, and then we opened it formally in 2021. Hmm. But the Hagen Center has always been in Erie. The, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're we're our, our larger umbrella is the Erie County Historical Society. Yeah. And so, and one, one thing I forgot to mention in my presentation, one of the things we're trying to do um in the education side is to develop school curriculum around the office space. Uh, so that teachers, can, as they bring their their class tours, and can can sort of have an experience and sort of build a lesson plan into into their experience, uh, and so we're kind of excited about that. That's sort of taking shape now. Thank you so much. And Fred challenged us to have some discussion of the relationship between stained glass and organic design. I was just going to point that out as well, Marta. And if anyone has heard Richard Guy Wilson's, um, the, the great American scholar on, on architectural history, lecture on organic design, uh, Marta and I were fortunate enough to bring uh, Richard in a couple of years ago to Springfield. Uh, he kind of poked fun at Wright's concept of organic design and what organic design actually looked like. Um, I, 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 wow, there, I shouldn't say this. Wow. I know in this audience, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're supposed to be in an icon worship here. Um, but if you've if you've ever been to that lecture and Richard has given it in various places across the country, um, it is um, a beautiful lecture. Okay, you're gonna leave it at that because we are <laughs> not, we are not here to poke, what, how do you say it? Put a stick oh. in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's wonder, it's, it's amazing actually, it's fascinating the subject of uh, 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 right, you know, we, when you talk organic uh, furniture, let's say, like, you know, the how he created, well, it, in a way, it was very controlling, right, in a way how uh, the, the we, we have other examples of organic uh, design where it's much more following the, you know, the, the shape of the of the uh, tree. From what I remember, uh, Richard was was kind of particularly kind of like, oh, is this, is this, is this uh, the accurate and how we how we uh, interpret uh, his architecture and design. All right. Well, um, I know that a number of you would have something to say about that. So if you if you can <laughs> if you can speak to a specifically organic design and stained glass, uh, you know how how you how you see it uh, and how you interpret it in the context of Wright's work. Is that to every, everybody or just every, the panel? I think everyone, everyone who's willing to speak to this subject. Well, I think I'm going to misquote him, but Tim Samuelson, who is one of the most knowledgeable people I know about Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan, and uh, one could say that Wright certainly learned a thing or two about an idea of organic architecture from Sullivan, from the master. Um, it's really not about nature or mimicking nature per se it's more about the organic whole of what he was doing so that the relationship of his glass designs were really about how it how it had harmony with the entire way that he designed the house like a roby house or dana thomas house where they have there's definitely an abstraction related to some plant material but if you look at uh unity temple for example there's, there's nothing organic about nature and about a natural plant thing. It's more about the relationship of the art, the art glass design to the whole. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of my, one of my big epiphanies of working on that building was seeing for the first time that there's actually a monogram in the art class of the Unity Temple, which is the U and the T, which I'd never seen anybody write anything about. Maybe some of the scholars on board here have seen somebody talk about that but i'd never heard that 
and then one day saw it. Now I can never not see it, of course. And uh, it totally makes sense. And I'm pretty sure he's the one who designed it, even though some of his some of his more gifted uh, people working with him probably did some of his art glass designs. I'm pretty sure he did the ones at Unity. But again, I would defer to uh, Jack and others that are super scholars. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, you, you mentioned Unity Temple. There is so many uh, little hints at the Westcott House uh, as this, these are, um, he worked on this project uh, uh, within the same time. And, you know, the, the, uh, the actually, like, I sometimes I'm amazed at the, how contemporary some of the concepts are. Like we have very simple square uh, motif uh, throughout the stained glass design here. Uh, which makes me think of of Unity Temple, and also our light fixtures are like a miniature Unity Temple in a sense. So it's really playful how he uh, translated it in a different. Um, the result is slightly different, but there is a theme definitely. So thank you. Any closing remarks? Any um, any comments? We got a lot of um, uh, in the chat. We have a lot of uh, pe grateful people for for this for this event. So thank you again all for being part of it. Thank you. Marta, I want to say that um, speaking on behalf of uh, all of us who had our cameras off and who weren't on screen, I, I was smiling throughout this entire event. Every There were so many little um, delightful nuggets that I picked up along the way. There was the, the collage of the blueprints from the uh, filling station and the breaking of the cube, which I thought was so cool. And the cabinetry that you mentioned, Kevin, was you know, as soon as I saw that slide, I thought, oh, there's Japan there. That's definitely Japan. And then you mentioned that the the glass was coming after this visit and the jumping for joy, you know, in the boathouse story and how light is never experienced the same. There were so many moments that just put a smile on my face and I wanted to, you know, share my smile with everybody else. And I'm sure that was reflected in the uh, webinar attendees. So Thank you for all of these little moments we all got to share. You guys really came together uh, to, to create an, uh, an amazing uh, time for all of us uh, watching and in the attendee audience. And, and it's obviously reflected in the comments. So please do have a look at those. And, and just from the bottom of, of my heart and all of us, thank you so much. This has been a really fun, very, very fun night morning <laughs> or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Evening um, here, Brian. Nine, nine right. p.m. Okay. Nine well, p.m. We, in the we, path of totality. Well, <laughs> not everywhere in the path, but and we did good. We were under two hours. I think that's <laughs> that might be kind of a record. <laughs> we tend to go on. <laughs> Everyone thinks that each presentation is a little over six minutes. They think they're going to be done in forty-five minutes, and no, no, here we are. So yeah, it's like the Oscars here. Thank you. Thank you for, 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 for staying with us to the end and answering questions. And uh, we'll be in touch with everyone and sharing the recording. So uh, our gratitude goes to all of you for putting such fabulous presentations together. Thank oh, you. Oh, Marta, before we go, uh, before oh. we go, let me, let's do, we got to do the PK tradition. I, I almost yes, to do the, yes. uh, oh, I'm so glad the you group remember. photo. Stay, Can I ask everybody to... Get in front of your camera, get your best face on, and let me just me memorialize this awesome session by a group photo. Let me get my screenshot. Yes, my hair's a little wave. shorter than in that 2020 photo, you Brian. Can you I can, had a haircut you can, in a long uh, time. Laugh, you can make a funny face, whatever you want to do. Yes, yes. Okay, here we go. Three, <laughs> two, one. Nice. Okay, one more. One more for good measure. Here we go. Three, okay. two, one. <laughs> Great. Right. Guys, so much. So oh, much fun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, our lovely hosts. And thank you, presenters. And thank you, the audience from all over the world. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Marta. Thank you, thank you Marta. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Marta. It was fun. Soon, hopefully. Thanks, Brian. So, so 2025, or maybe <laughs> squeeze another one in in 2024. Until then, <laughs> Until yeah. Then. We'll be yeah. Okay, see you guys next time. All Bye. the best. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.